Ron Troop is one of the major driving forces of stuckism in the world, which probably doesn't say a lot, but uh, <laughs> it's something. No, actually, I mean, you know, in historical terms, if you look at um, remodernism in the world, there's very few people, or stuckism in the world, there's very few people, few people that stand out as driving forces. Because there's some people in this country, and the original stuckists, uh, people like, uh, well, Edgeworth Johnson, who's holding the camera, um, Abby Guru, Paul Harvey, um, Joe Machine, I'm sure there's somebody I've missed out on. <laughs> there, but never mind. And in America, Ron Troop's one of them, uh, Richard Bledsoe has been very active in Prague, um, particularly Jamison Apalaka and uh, uh, Jerry Hauschka, um, well, and our have been staging shows, including people from different groups, different stuckist centres around the world. So yeah, you know, these are taking place inside a private house, which is great, because anybody can have a show. Someone came up to me the other day and said, ooh, my friends want to be exhibited in a gallery, and I said, well, make a gallery. I mean, the White Cube, somebody made the gallery, it didn't exist, you know, someone made it. Make one, yourself, in your room, in your house, just call it a gallery. What, what, why not? Who's to say you can't do it? And you can invite people round. Um, you can put it on YouTube, you know? I mean, how many people visited this exhibition? Probably about six, if you're lucky. And yet it's going to go out to many more people through YouTube. And if you do want to come along and see a show, get in touch with Edgeworth. I'm sure there's a way that you can do that. He'll host a way of getting in touch. And you can come round and he might even interview you. So, you know, I'm Charles Thompson. I co-founded, well, I had the idea of Stuckism and then co-founded with Billy Childish in 1999, although he left after a couple of years. And I've been sort of doing it since. And uh, it's been going 25 years with some fantastic artists. Well, I'm consistently impressed by Ron Troop, and he posts on the Stuckism Facebook group. And whenever I see a painting that's rather good, very crude, but somehow enigmatic and captivating, and I don't know who the hell it's by, I assume it's by Ron Troop, <laughs> and it always is. Um, so you can tell his because they never look like his paintings, but they don't look like anybody else's paintings either. I'm beginning to get the hang of it, but he is a free ranger. I mean, he explores. Some artists kind of have a production line where they've got their style mapped out and it would just be a different subject, which is okay, that's fine, you know. Um, most artists are probably like that. But I think with Ron Troop, Every painting is a new experience. He doesn't know where it's going to go. He doesn't quite know what style he's going to use. Um, and I wonder what he thinks, you know, when he's finished. So it's endlessly interesting to look at his. I would say they're all good, but in a kind of way, being good in art isn't good enough. You've got to be better than that. And a lot of his are much better than that. Um, it's like any subject, you know, when you're familiar with it and you've done it a lot, you develop a connoisseurship, meaning that you develop a sensitivity to that subject, whatever it is, wine or horses, or in this case, art. So I'm going to look at some of them because that will be a better way of saying what I want to. And we're going to look at this cat. I love it. This cat is fantastic. I've never seen a cat quite like it before, with a shadow over it. <laughs> um, he's really captured that sort of frustration and sort of anger and desire of a cat fixated on something and not quite being able to get it. But when you look at art, you have to look at how someone's done something and the colours they've used. Um, they're all quite subtle, and the form, and the drawing, and the way it's done. So I'm going to contrast that, which I think is fantastic, with this, which is competent. It's not that unusual. I mean, it's relatively unusual, but if that was all the stuff that Ron had done, it wouldn't be as interesting. Um, 
And I want to look at another one which I don't think works very well. Um, he's got very often exquisite colour combinations. And the green and the red work well, but they are things you tend to see a lot, especially in German Expressionism and Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, green and red, because they're unusual things to put together. Um, I don't think it really quite goes with the blue, and I don't like these shapes before, behind. I think they're the worst bits of all these paintings. And because I'm a fan of Ron's, I wanted to say something negative to start with. Otherwise people will think I'm just a, a sycophant, which I am, so I don't want them to know. And I've just told them, so I shouldn't have done that. Too late, damn, ouch. <laughs> okay, this one I love here, the ginger cat. We seem to be concentrating on cats. Um, it's charming. And any quality that a painting has that stands out is a good thing. Something might be, well, I'll get on to some other qualities or some different ones, but some of them might be frightening or gloomy or um, excited. And this one is charming. And it's quite hard to get a quality. I say it's quite hard. For someone like Ron Troop, it's not that hard because he is open to his feelings. That's obvious when you look around, he's open to his feelings. And that's one of the hardest things for people to be. And yet it's the simplest thing, just trust yourself. And a lot of artists are going around thinking, what will someone else think about it? Does it fit in with this standard or that standard? He doesn't have that issue. He doesn't have that problem at all. You know, there's no standards in his work. There's just Ron Troop expressing himself. So please, let's look at this, because you've got these lovely little shapes floating around and he's given us an insight into what's going on inside the cat, all the things the cat's thinking about and you really feel that he has got a feeling and sensitivity for this cat and furthermore it's gone beyond that, it's gone inside the cat, not just what it looks like on the outside but what's going on in the inside. And I think you could characterise most of Ron's work as what's going on at the inside. Let's go and look at this one. It draws from earlier work, and I'm going to mention somebody that most people have never heard of, called um, Walter Gramate, who was a German expressionist. Rather like Lupo Sol, who is a Spanish stuckist and remodernist painter. Um, but again, Ron has made something of his own. You can see the connection with early work, you can see the difference. And the colours are superbly well handled here. They're dark and subtle, and you've only got to strike one false note, and it ruins the whole painting. You've got to have the whole thing cohering in a mood. And that mood is obviously some kind of <laughs> extreme distress and anxiety. And what I like about a lot of Stuckist work and a lot of this work is there's also a story you can read into it. It doesn't tell you exactly what's going on, it tells you enough for you to be able to imagine a bit more. Because there's a figure here with what appears to be the weapon, a rifle. A very small figure. And he's put them there to make a connection. Well, you know, what do you think it's about? You, the viewer, why, why is it there like that? To me, I suppose it's somebody that's looking at what's relatively innocuous. You know, it's the presentation of the military in a kind of toy soldier way, in a parade ground way. But this person has gone something deeper inside themselves with a kind of horror, you know, anguish, destruction, suffering of war. And what happens when that seemingly harmless character actually takes part in the activity that he's been trained for? Like we're rolling. This is delightfully dreamlike. The 
colours are, are lovely, particularly this deeper sort of maroon there really makes it work. Um, and I like the way it's fuzzy around the edges. Creates more of a sense of a dream. Don't know what's going on there. Could be a rabbit, certainly a person. And maybe there's another rabbit up there in the clouds. I'm not going to give an interpretation of what it means because I kind of enjoy looking at it without having to say because the colours resonate, the forms, the shapes, they resonate. It's like people that can hear a poem without knowing the meaning in a foreign language and pick up on the sounds. Um, that's what I feel about that one. Now, what are we going to look at? This one's crazy. It's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle before you've fitted the bits together. And it's kind of fun. There's a figure up there that's slightly threatening, although you could see it as just being a kind of a Halloween mask. Or you might find it something frightening. Um, I think it's well done. It's not my favourite, and I'll tell you why, because it doesn't have so much emotional resonance. It's more ideas, concepts. The one I just pointed out down there that's a bit fuzzy. To me, you're entering into something deeper. Whereas here, because it's clearly defined, it seems to me like sort of ideas about something, which is fine. Ideas about what? I haven't got a clue. Um, a lot of Ron's work is like that. <laughs> you haven't got a clue. You can make it up if you want. I mean, if somebody else will look at it and see it completely different to me. They'll say, oh yeah, it's because this and this and that and the other. But that one, no, I don't understand. Um, this one I do, and for me, understand. Um, it's got allusions to things. I mean, someone wearing a crown is a very powerful symbol. Because um, it can be like in that, um, there's a film, can't remember the name of the living thing now, where the police sergeant goes to an island and he ends up getting burnt in a wicker man. It's called the wicker man, that's right. So in that case, the crown is like a satire, it's like a violation of the king, because the king gets destroyed. Or it can be, be the king, it can be something like a tarot card. Um, it can be someone who imagines themselves wearing a crown, it can be a real one, or it can be a, a Christmas cracker crown, and it's ambiguous. But what strikes me is not so much that, because anybody could draw a crown, you could draw it in a completely different way, and it wouldn't have any real feeling to it. You know, if you just got yellow out of the tube and splashed it on there, it would be really crude. And again, the way art works, it's not just the narrative, it's not just the literal meaning, oh, there's a ship, there's a bird, there's a man with a crown. It's the mood and it's created, it's communicating, right, on an unconscious level. It's like when you dream, you might dream of, I don't know, a great, um, a grey landscape because that represents your emotional state of at that time. Maybe the greyness is like because you're feeling depressed. But how do you represent that physically? Well, in a dream, a dream's very good at representing ideas and states in a visual way. Also quite often with puns. Um, so you might sound feeling blue and you might actually dream you're in a blue landscape, literally. And that's how you've got to look at, certainly Ron's art, you've got to look at it as to what it's telling you. I mean, there's a seriousness. I mean, you can, you, I don't have to say these things in words because it's more important to me to absorb them, you know, and be there in that state. But I'm going to try and put it into words because we're communicating with other people and words are the way we do it. But this is Second hand, right? This is second rate and second hand, putting in words. 
is intense, is thoughtful. That's very good because it's not just any old face with a crown. You can sense a seriousness and a purpose in this person. And there's hints about what might be going on because this looks like to me like a sailing ship. So is that what that person's gonna be doing? Is that what that person has done? Is there something important to him on the ship? I can give answers, but I think the good thing about this is everybody can come up with their own answers. So they'll come up with something different. To me, I really admire the seriousness of that face. And the colours are, and you probably won't come out very well on film, but through this face, there's a subtle variation from slightly more orangey brown to a, a darker brown, a more yellowy colour there with some highlights. And again, you're coming up here, the colour changes. That's the brightest bit of the face. Look at the transition from the chin to the nose to the forehead. It's very controlled, but you can look at that and think, oh, it's just splashed it on. Well, to me, that's a bit like looking at a house or a wall and saying, all they've done is put the bricks in a line. Anybody can put the bricks in a line. You try it. <laughs> Your house will fall down. <laughs> Your wall will be all over the place. The highest skill is the one which you can't see because the thing's perfect. To me, this is the best of Ron Troop. You know, it really is. Um, I'm going to just go down, slide down the wall a little bit. And this is good. It's interesting. It's not the best of Ron Troop. Um, one thing I'm not all that keen on is the fact that this purple is a bit transparent and I think that's because purple comes out of the tube a bit transparent. It's quite nice, but it doesn't have the subtlety of the one we've just looked at with the crown. I think, if anything, if this purple was perhaps toned down a bit, more like this part bit here, I think these lighter bits don't have the same resonance. You know, when you're combining things, it's like you've got a band, you combine everything. You've got the rhythm of the drums, you've got the bass guitar, you've got the rhythm guitar, you've got the lead guitar, you've got the singer. They all have to cohere exactly. And it's like that with a painting, everything has to cohere exactly to really stand out. And this is, yeah, this is like a good one, but Somehow, maybe the lead guitar has got too much presence. You know, it needs to be turned down a bit, the volume. So I think this purple really needs to be turned down. But it's kind of there. It'd be very easy to fix. That's just my opinion. Um, I'm going to look at this because I immediately say the word Miro, who is one of the surrealist painters, who tended to use these overlapping flat shapes. And that's how someone in a remodernist period can use something that someone's done in the modernist period and adapt it for his own purposes. So you can see the link with Miro there. You can also see he's fused it with other elements, like just abstract colour in the background. One thing I could say about a lot of his work has a very strong abstract element. Um, he's fused figurative, meaning showing a figure, not necessarily a human figure, you know, if a tree is a figure, a ship is a figure. So he's got figurative elements with abstract elements, which I'm quite fond of doing myself, so that's why I mention it. Um, some of the idiots done a wrong true t-shirt. Oh, that's you, sorry. So some very um, great admiring person who values wrong has done a rather disgusting dirt. It's done a very nice expressionist t-shirt, which I don't think I'd want to wear myself, but it would be great to wear it. It's just that I've got a t-shirt already. Thanks. <laughs> um, oh, here we go. Look, that's what's up here. So here we have um, Ron plundering Nero, not copying him, just 
using certain elements. This is the way that Wordsworth used certain elements of Shakespeare's sonnet to make his own sonnet, although slightly different, never mind Petrarchan and Shakespeare and sonnet coming in for that. Um, people who know what I'm talking about with literature will understand that reference just to show you I do know a little bit of what I'm talking about. I'm not completely idiot, thank you very much. Let's move on quickly. Don. So <laughs> I look at that and I immediately think of a, um, a group of painters called Cobra, I think started in uh, the Netherlands or Holland. Um, and Carol Appel was one of the lead artists and they wanted to paint like children, which of course you can't do, but you can make a nice mess on the way. So you just invent these kind of shapes and it's quite good fun. It's different. I think, as T.S. Eliot said about poetry, it's like, the one thing it can't be is like boring. It's like that with art. And Picasso knew that. He really went to town on it. He showed people something different to what they'd ever seen before in their lives. And that's remarkable to show somebody something different. It doesn't matter what you make of Picasso, whether you think it's like a six year old, which is certainly not, um, whether you think he's a genius, whether you think he's a, a maverick or an imposter. The fact is, he did create something which is very powerful, which was different. Okay, then you could evaluate something just being different for its own sake is not necessarily a good thing. I mean, I can do that. And that's different to a normal presentation, but does it actually have any real value? Well, it probably has a little bit of novelty value, but you know, it's not very much value in terms of talking about the art. But it's different, but it's trivial. Um, shall we whiz on quickly? There we go. That's. Uh, a bit of a combination of things, a bit of expressionism, I and mean, he's really gone to town there, let rip, boom, colours all over the place. But again, looks like any old thing going on anywhere, but it's not, it's controlled. Um, there's actually no colours that have, he's just come out of the tube with and plonked on the canvas, which a lot of people do. They're all mixed, they're all refined. Um, it's invented all the way through. There's scribbles with back of the paintbrush. There's very vigorous marks. There's more blended in marks. Um, different colours popping up all over the place. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't. I kind of enjoy it. Um, more than that one, I think. I'd say there you actually do have a, a touch with the Picassos with a funny nose. Um, I, I sort of like Rollins best when it's not quite so rigidly defined. But that's a matter of taste. Okay, I have saved the best for last, um, by accident, <laughs> not design. <laughs> We've seen this one, which has this kind of dream quality. There's another one there with a similar quality. That's, I, I've compared that with the one I've just looked at. Um, I find this relatively crude, you know, I think he didn't have the same sensitivity doing this one. It's, it's good, you know, it's an interesting painting, but for my money, this has much greater sensitivity. I'm not saying all of his should be like this, I'm just saying this is one that resonates with me. I can imagine waking up in the middle of the night and feeling like that, and furthermore, the way he's painted it captures that feeling. You could paint somebody else sitting up in bed and it wouldn't have the same feeling. And moving across slightly, I think we'll, we'll end with two. We'll end with, this is the penultimate one. Oh look, I've just seen this figure. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> it's got the crown on that looks of it. And some wise, benevolent figure it looks like to me. Um, what's going on there? It's a sort of parent type figure. Maybe a, a child, something's happened with the rabbit, I don't know. Um, the colours are, are lyrical. They're gentle, they're evocative. I'd like to inhabit that painting. I wouldn't like to inhabit this painting particularly. Um, I, I, I feel that I have at times inhabited this, looking at a cat, you know, certain moods. And that one, 
is just a lovely painting. But I'm going to finish with one I may have started with, which is this cat again, which I think really reaches out to a wider audience. Some of the way he's done things will put some people off or they won't think it's very well done. But I can imagine a lot of people relating to that and finding that charming and evocative and sympathising and empathising with the cat. It's not photographic because actually you can use cameras for that. So here I'll do a slight digression into modernism. Um, before modernism we had the Renaissance, before the Renaissance um, we had medieval, and before that we had Greek and Roman, and before that you can go back. But let's just stick with the Renaissance, where everybody worked to the same rules. You had to observe the correct proportions of a human body, you had to model it so it was looking solid, with three dimensions, with different light and shade, which then affected the colour, and then you put the whole thing in a, a perspective box so that something at the back looked further away in the distance than something close up to us. And whatever Renaissance work you look at, and we're talking about from, I don't know, sort of around about 1500 up until <clears throat> the end of the 19th century, followed those rules. And for various reasons, including the invention of photography, those rules were shattered. Um, there was no point sitting there making something look ultra realistic, but all you had to do was press a button when the camera did it for you. So art had to do something else. And the people that really started doing that were the post-impressionists like Van Gogh, Gauguin, Seurat, Cezanne. And that led on to the whole of modernism with the stars of Picasso and Matisse. And if you look at modernism, it's a series of movements. Each one came up with its own approach. Expressionism was agitated brushwork and distorted forms. Pop art was taking commercial imagery. Surrealism was letting the unconscious and the dream world and the irrational manifest. So you've got these different movements, one replacing the other until you end up finally with people kind of not believing in movements anymore because each one seemed to be replaced by another one that said it was better. And that brings us to the end of the 20th century and into this century, the 21st century, with postmodernism, which is looking back at the whole of modernism and getting disillusioned, thinking, oh dear, we can't believe in anything anymore. We've got to find something to hold as a value. So what replaced a belief in progress and truth was a belief in commercialism, um, in money, in celebrity and novelty. Well, the Stuckist movement, which I founded with Billy Childish in 1999, was set up to oppose that, was set up to look back on modernism and say, wow, there's a whole load of really brilliant things in modernism which we can make use of, which we can develop. And that's what has normally happened in art or writing. I mean, Shakespeare wrote, um, he wrote sonnets. And so did Wordsworth, you know, a few centuries later, because he developed, he made made into his own for what he wanted to say. He didn't say, well, the sonnet's been done, you know, rhyming poetry's been done, we can't bother with that. No, I can use it in my way and move on from these people in the past. So that's what Stuckism does, and it's called it remodernism because we're taking modernism and we're using it we're, for our own purposes. So coming back to Ron, Ron Troop, he is very much what you would call, I would call a remodernist. He's not a Renaissance painter. He doesn't sit there studying things to make sure everything's in the right proportion. As I said, this cat is certainly not in the right proportion unless it's been run over by a lorry.